Thank you, Ingrid. And first of all, I just have to comment on your earlier remark about the difficult job that you have standing out in the wind and the cold and the rain and the rest of us talk about public sector reform from our cosy offices. I'd have traded that position with you um, last February. The canvas has been a fall TD in the in the winter months of last February, uh, looking for votes, I can assure you it was not an easy task. But some of us did survive, and we're here, we are here to fight another day. First of all, I want to thank the McGill Summer School and Joe Mulholland in particular for the invitation to speak here today on the topic of transforming the public sector. I'd like to make just a few general comments in relation to the current commentary on this topic and the Crow Park Agreement. And I have to say, some people in the private sector believe that our, our public sector is an inefficient bureaucracy with too many time wasters and they need a bit of private sector economic harsh realities to sort them out. Now, I do not subscribe to that view, but that view is held by some people. Nor do I subscribe to the view of some public servants who believe because of the reduced numbers and having to, do with more than, having to achieve more with less, it's not necessary to talk about any further public sector reform because they are suffering number cuts and pay cuts. I don't accept that either. And I do believe the focus has to be on our citizens for whom the public service is there to provide a consumer-friendly and efficient service. The first progress report in the Crow Park Agreement has come out and to reasonable commentary and I know further speakers will speak on that in due course. All I have to say is on the next report we will examine it in much more rigour to ensure the specifics that the claim for job reductions and cost savings are actually proven in the actual report that is produced. Uh, over the years 2009 and 2010, 15,000 people left the public service. The target for this government, which they're committed to implementing, is for another 25,000 people to leave the public service, which will mean a reduction of 40,000 people from an original figure of 300,000 or so uh, just a few short years ago. And that is a 13% reduction, and that is a very, uh, very serious uh, reduction in staff numbers indeed, and that has to be acknowledged. Now, we're talking about reform, but much of public discussion confuses public sector reform with public sector modernization. And reform is about ethos, culture, and putting the citizen first. Modernization, in my view, is about efficiency, achieving more with less, staffing issues, and sharing and integrating uh, services. And real public sector reform is about providing citizens with policy making and service delivery in a citizen focused manner. And it should not start with the preoccupations of those people in the system who are providing the service. Reform should have three central elements. It should be, as I've already said, citizen focused. Equality must be at the core and access must be guaranteed to all. Public sector reform should be about providing a consumer friendly interaction with the government without creating excessive burden on either the citizen or the public bodies. And the first example I want to give, and it's a well-worn example, is the issue of standardization of the means testing procedures. Many individuals have to face separate means tests when dealing with government departments for social welfare entitlements, housing applications, medical card applications, and education grants. On many occasions, the same individual will have to undergo five separate means tests, and that is a tremendous waste of the public's time and public body's time. I can say um, citizen focus has to be the primary issue because every public body and every public organization in the country, um, in my opinion, and I think this is the fundamental point, and I want to give this a specific example that people have glossed over in the last year. The central uh, primary issue in, for every public body when there is a difficulty is to protect the organization and its staff. That comes before their job, it comes before the people they serve, it comes before democracy, and it comes before everything else. The basic function of most public sector organization is to protect itself. Delivering the service comes a second. And um, I want to give an example on this based on my work as the Public Accounts Committee. And I consider it a most terrific example, and I was surprised there wasn't more about it last year, even though you will recall the incident. Last year, the then Chief Executive, the Health Executive, was asked at the Public Accounts Committee by myself, how many children died while in the care of the HSE? I repeat that, how many children died while in the care of the HSE? Neither he nor anybody around him could answer that question. In fact, they had never even checked it. It took them over a month to find out the number. 
of children who had died in their care. And that took quite a while. And it was also established that the HSE had never, never in its existence up to that point, published a report in relation to any child had died in its care. And the sole reason and only reason for this was the HSE had always felt that publication of such a report could have legal <coughs> implications for the HSE and its staff. Their approach was to ensure that no report would ever be published in relation to children who died in their care. I can think of no more grotesque an approach by a public body. The HSE approach was amoral and not befitting any organization with responsibility for dealing with children. And I just cast it to the debate we're having on that topic in the last couple of weeks as well. And in this regard, I do welcome the establishment of the new Department of Children, which will take this role completely away from the HSE into the future. Um, when dealing with citizens, we do have to also look at the question of the state's finances. And we need a clear definition based on citizens' rights regarding the funding that should be made available uh, to provide public service. And I want to give an example of what I'm talking about here. We have many what we call demand-led services, say, for example, in the Department of Social Welfare. Um, uh, you know, as people need to claim social welfare payments, they will be paid in a reasonable period of time. And if there are a lot of extra application for job seekers' allowance or whatever the case may be, uh, if additional funding is required at the end of the year, a supplementary estimate will be approved by the Oireachtas to meet that because people will not be left without their social welfare payment, payments. However, on the other hand, if a person is in serious pain and urgently needs serious surgery, say even for a hip, hip operation, they will just be put on a waiting list. Uh, the service will not be provided and there will be no supplementary estimate for those people and they will just have to be put on the waiting list and they will get the operation when the budget says they can do so. So there is a clear distinction between the provision of services and some we hide behind the budget and other areas. Uh, the citizen comes first, and if the citizen has a claim, he will get his claim dealt with, but not so, for instance, in the Department of Health. The ethos of the public service is living proof of how a country uh, is run. And I do have to say, most public service pride themselves in carrying out a good job to the best of their ability in the public interest without fear or favour. We do have to acknowledge there are differences and divisions between the public and private sector. These are not good for either side, and I believe there should be far greater movement of staff and transfers between the public and private sectors. People say you should always have a quarantine when moving from one to the other. I personally don't agree with that, because I think it would bring a greater understanding to both the public sector and the private sector as to how they operate, each other operates, and that would help eliminate some of these divisions. Staff development is also a key issue, and I know other people will talk about those issues. Leadership is much needed at senior levels in the public service, but many uh, senior managers in the public service openly admit that they've never received any management or leadership training, and they've effectively been administrators all their lives, and there is a big difference. Also, in relation to public sector reform, we do have to be con conscious of our role within the EU because there's so much exchange of information between our public bodies and EU public bodies, whether it's social protection, agriculture and food, policing issues, and a variety of others. Now moving on to what I would call, what most people refer to as public sector reform, what I only call modernization. This is about efficiency and accountability. And they are the two issues that re recently or specifically spring to my mind. Also, it is important in the public service that there is adequate entry opportunities at all grades for people to apply for senior positions, and promotion should, must always be open to the outside. I would also suggest, and I congratulate our new Secretary General here today, but I would say that in future the position of Secretary General and Chief Executive of State Organization should always be subject to an international competition and there should always be at least one person from outside the country on such an interview panel. Shared services, especially in the human resources area, simplifying procedures, information technologies, these have been mentioned time and time again and these areas, if properly implemented, can actually make uh, significant savings. Um, the public are very much concerned about the issue of implementation of particular policies of government and, and they should be separated from the issue of making the policy decisions. 
Um, however, I do believe in a country of 4.5 million people, we have gone too far down the road of separating policy making from implementation. And that has result, resulted in an undue number of new quangos cre created in recent times. And these have been created to implement a very specific mandate. And in fact, most new quangos have very little public accountability anymore. The case is now well accepted, I think, by everyone in the country that there are too many quangos and they should be brought back under the control of their own parent or department. The sharing of information, and that's one thing we all talk about, uh, will have serious implications for data protection legislation, and this will have to be dealt with. But I believe the public will accept that if they give their information to one public body, they will not generally have a problem with another public body using it for a legitimate source without them having to go through a procedure of supplying the same information again to another public body. I did mention the issue of accountability, and recently we did see an example of public accountability where individual public servants were made account for their actions. This actually, believe it or not, sends shockwaves through the public service, and in my opinion, it was an excellent lesson for all public servants, and they learned it very quickly. The case I refer to is very simply is where the most senior official in Wicklow County Council was arrested by the Garda Shia Khan, the county manager, in relation to health and safety issues after two uh, firemen died while carrying out their duties on a fire in Bray some time ago. I'm not sure whether this case has progressed to court, but the principle of ensuring that people are responsible and accountable um, for health and safety of their staff is a very welcome development. It was almost unprecedented for a public servant to be arrested for neglect of his duty, and I use the word neglect advisedly because the issue hasn't gone to court. But the fact that that actually happens in shockwaves across the public service. I heard it from every local authority, every public body. They were horrified that they think individuals in the public service could actually be made answer for their own action or lack of action. And that was a very good day's work. And we will watch developments in that, in that area. Another thing the public want to see in public services is consistency. And for example, I quote the Department of Agriculture who are ruthlessly and rightly consistent in their approach to approving single farm payments and everything like that. The reason is because they're subject to random EU audit. And you will get the same decision in relation to an application, whether you're in Malinhead or Mizenhead or down in Port Leash, because they know it's subject to random audit. And I can say categorically, no other government department is as consistent in its approach to making decisions for the public in this regard. And I do believe when you get inconsistencies from department to the department and at regional level in the country, it does not provide a fair service to our citizens. And I, I actually believe if all public bodies were subject to a random order, we would immediately achieve a greater consistency. And I will just give two examples. Approximately 50% of all appeals to Onboard Planola and approximately 50% of all appeals to the Social Welfare Appeals Office result in a change of the original decision. So this demonstrates that there must have been some major level of inconsistency in relation to how decisions were made in the first place, if almost 50% on appeals result in changes to those decisions. Also, the last point I want to deal with is the question of regulators, and we had excellent regulators here last night, to deal, and they've been introduced to deal with various aspects, mainly in the commercial area in Ireland. But they too have achieved a level of independence that is, again, substantially removing their decision-making process from outside the area of public accountability. The question that regularly gets asked is, who regulates the regulator? And the answer in Ireland is, frankly, nobody. Public sector reform also has to deal with this issue. Finally, I want to say everybody in Ireland recognises the difficult financial situation we were in. People accept that changes need to be made in relation to the provision of all services in the country, both in the private and in the public sector. Now is the time to make these changes. I believe the time for reforming the public sector is now. Thank you very much indeed.